In this interview, we're diving deep into the world of personal development and communication with a true trailblazer in the field, Ross Jeffries. Renowned as the godfather of the modern seduction community, Ross has transformed the lives of thousands worldwide. He's honed a technology known as speed seduction, a unique application of neuro-linguistic programming designed to enhance communication, persuasion, and ultimately help men heal deep-suited wounds and resentment so that they can finally access the kind of fulfillment with women they desire. In this candid conversation, expect to laugh and to have your beliefs challenged. So bring an open mind and a sense of humor. Please note, Ross does have a penchant for colorful language, so viewer discretion is advised. You've been going by Ross Jeffries yes. for decades now. Yes. Right. But your actual name is Paul Ross. Yes. Okay. How did that come about? You just wanted to protect your family from your notoriety? <laughs> when am I a freaking Batman? I wear the mask to protect my loved ones. No. When I wrote my book in 1988, I figured, use a pseudonym, Mark Twain is really Sam Clemens, and so I figured, let's take my last name, Ross, put it first, and then my middle name is Jeffrey, so I just thought Jeffries. I just stuck somehow, Ross Jeffrey stuck, and that's what I slapped on the cover of my book, How to Get the Women You Desire into Bed, a down and dirty guide to dating and seduction for the man who's fed up with being Mr. Nice Guy, still available on Amazon. <laughs> Before we get into your notorious reputation, your very dark and notorious reputation. I don't think it's dark and notorious among the people who've studied my stuff. They view me as a savior. I agree with you, but we're going to assume that these people who are watching have not right. studied your stuff. Okay. okay, so they're ignorant. Let's. <laughs> so let's get into some questions about persuasion. Is that cool? Okay, Can do sure. that first. All right. How important is it to be persuasive? Do, would you say it? Well, that's like saying how important is it to have a beating heart? It's part of life. Okay. If you're not persuasive, how's that going to cost you in your relationships, business, personal, in writing, in, in video like we're doing right now? It's crucial. It's so part of human communication. You can either persuade and control the frame of the conversation, or you can be the one who's being controlled. Unless it's in a setting where there's absolute trust and you already have a relationship that's been built. When you are in a situation, there's a hierarchy of power. You better be sure that you know that you how to communicate. You know how to communicate, and you're the one who's sliding yourself into the frame. That you're in the position of power. People don't want to speak about power in communication. They don't want to do it. It's a third rail. But in fact, there's always a hierarchy. There's always a power dynamic when people are communicating. And it's uh, other than an uh, intimate relationship, like a good friend or a family member, etc. Should they be teaching like everybody this in school or should we not? I don't know that there are any shoulds in the world. I think it would be useful for people to learn the skill sets. Yeah, sure. What can you tell us about persuasion that most people don't already know? Because you hear the kind of, the, you know, the basic stuff that you would read anywhere on how sure. to be persuasive. So my overall model is that the way I teach it, persuasion is about two things. It's about getting your ideas, sliding your ideas into the unconscious mind of your prospect or your victim, not <laughs> your prospect, but it's also about expanding their mind to include your ideas, your new ideas. So it's a matter of expanding consciousness. The idea that persuasion, whether it's for sales or seduction or any other application, is about creating states of consciousness and chaining or linking those states of consciousness to what it is that I want, or in your case, you want, if you're using my stuff, that's a pretty radical, unique idea that's about expanding consciousness. What are persuasion killers that a lot of people do, but don't realize they're doing it? They're too focused on the behaviors that they want from people. Like when I teach seduction, guys always say, how can I get her phone number? How can I get her to go out with me? I say, no, 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 no. You're focused on the behavior. The phone number is useless unless it's connected to these questions, which are, how can I create a state of connection? How can I create a state where she feels incredibly attractive? How can I'm glancing over at your <laughs> lovely wife? How can I create a state where she feels totally focused, totally fascinated, and really wanting more. How do I do that? Because you have to understand, let me use a metaphor. I have a sheet of gold foil, I have a sheet of cardboard. 
and I want to conduct a current of electricity, which one of those, it's not a trick question, which one of those mediums is going to conduct the electricity? It's not a trick question. Cardboard or gold foil? It's not like gold foil for sure. Exactly. So think of the states of consciousness that you uh, are going to have your prospect subject in as being the conductive medium and your words as being the electricity. What state of consciousness do I want them in? Do I want them in the cardboard state of being distracted or bored or disinterested or skeptical? Or do I want them in the states of suggestibility, of willing suspension of disbelief, of focus, of fascination, of seeing me as their leader? Because then if I create that, every word will be received through that filter. And by the way, I mentioned something. I mentioned the word focus. This is very crucial to understand. People talk about rapport and you have to take 10 minutes or an hour to really build rapport in a sales situation. No one has that focus anymore. I have here in my pocket, it'll disrupt the microphone if I reach for it. That's okay. I have my, I have my smart device, my cell phone. Mm. How many times do you look at your cell phone per day? I don't even want to think about it. Okay, <laughs> and all the folks at home, I ask you that question. I ask you that question. I ask you that question a lot. And so the average attention span has been cut down to, if you're lucky, 30 seconds. So you need to create those states of focus very, very quickly. You can't rely on traditional scripts or any of the other stuff. So my claim is both in writing and in video and one to many or one to one, you can create those states of focus. In fact, you have to. That's required before you do rapport. It's a prerequisite to rapport. And rapport itself is only as useful as far as it serves compliance. Compliance is what I aim for. So you do want rapport and... Only, only as far as it serves my real goal, which is compliance. Okay, and, and when they're... So I see rapport as trust and familiarity. They feel familiar with you enough, they trust you enough, to go on a date with you. Dude. What if it's possible to you? get obedience without trust? Okay, now you're getting into the dark territory. That's I don't know that obedience. it's dark. I What's, just think it's okay. it's controversial and untraditional. Mm -hmm. So do you really want someone to obey you? I want someone compliant. I want someone responsive. How about that? I, I can go, get on okay. with that. Responsive. But like when you say, so when you say obedience and I think about my wife or anyone, I think, I'm, I'm no, fucking no, with you I, to get a response <laughs> yeah. and, to, and to get a response from your viewers. So you get more likes and views. But so this is kind of the stuff that I, I, this is what has built what you said when I said dark, uh, you do have a dark reputation depending on what does that mean? Let me challenge you, sure. man. I'm serious. Yeah. Cause what does that mean? What does dark mean? Okay. Evil intent, evil yeah, result. Yeah, so I don't, and, and the same thing with Jurgen, who is not not that at all. And that, that's why I wanted to uh, interview him. When I yeah. met him, I was like, oh, right. this is not the guy who I built up in my mind based on what other people were saying. Right. And I knew you well enough or what you were putting out there to, I was like, oh man, they're gonna, you know, they think this stuff about you, but you're doing it on purpose. You know that. Yeah, so it's, they're, they're creating these dark, Images in your mind of, of you. And so it's like, it's great when, for business. yeah, I bet. So when you say something like obedience, I was like, I don't really want my wife to be obedient to me. I, I would really turn me off. I'm looking at your wife and figure <laughs> I wouldn't mind. <laughs> <laughs> but no, it's, I mean, for uh, maybe as a role play, you know, yeah. something like that. Okay, <laughs> fine. But as a, <laughs> but as an ongoing relationship, we're I'm, having fun already. Aren't yeah, we? <laughs> no, I, I knew this was going to happen. <laughs> I'm a firecracker. <laughs> this is fun. All right. So, when you say what does dark mean? Yeah, I think like bad intent, evil intent. I don't have bad intent. I don't I think, think you, you do. Tell I do. I yeah, don't have bad but the stuff you say makes it sound like I understand. It's designed to shock people. What is the I guess uh, the bigger goal of that? The Just to get attention, goal. or <coughs> the bigger goal of what? Uh, shocking people gets attention, sells the potatoes, and it delineates me from people who might otherwise be seen as competition. And it creates a character. I want to make, uh, one of my favorite movies is Batman Begins. And there's a scene in Batman Begins where Bruce Wayne is flying back with his butler, Alfred, and he's explaining why he can no longer just be Bruce Wayne. He says, as a man, I can be ignored, I can be destroyed, but as a symbol, I can be something everlasting. I can be a myth. 
People need dramatic examples to shake them from their apathy, and I can't do that as a man. So Ross Jeffries has become a myth, an urban legend. I'm not joking about this. Look at the expression on my face. I truly believe this, as weird as it sounds, that Ross Jeffries was a response to the outcry of the collective unconsciousness of all these men who were suffering. Somehow that got sent to me and I chose to step up and be the person who's sort of like, someone once called me the sex messiah to the nerves. <laughs> I don't like that. That's a pejorative term about my clients and students for that aspect of what I do. Yeah. So my thing would be then, aren't you afraid of attracting the wrong kind of people with real dark intent and then handing them weapons? That can, well, that, that has happened. I'm sure it has. But look, anything powerful can be misused. I cannot control every single person who gets access to my material. And for that matter, uh, I don't think anyone could. But I will be, I, I have, to my credit, kicked people out of my events or cut them out of my organization if I found they're doing things that are... Well, my thing is, is like, what, if you were just saying it like, here, yeah, I'm going to help you uh, meet women, connect with them very quickly, and then it's left up to you with how, where you want to take it next, whether that's a relationship or uh, a one-night stand. But no, you purposefully like say these things that are really shocking. And that's what I'm saying. Like, doesn't that, uh, I want doesn't people that to stay attract? tuned throughout and watch the whole damn interview instead of clicking off. I'm but don't you think some guys would, are turned off by that who would normally. I don't give a fuck. <laughs> I would look, I was raised in a family where you got attention. You had to fight for attention. Now you're getting into my psychology, which I'll willingly share. Okay. So I was raised in a family with five very smart siblings, four of whom are older. No. You had five siblings? I had five siblings. Oh, okay. One passed on. Okay. Okay. So four of them were older than me. And then I have a younger brother. I had to compete for attention at the dinner table because everyone was talking. It was a chit-chattering and cacophony of raucous whatever. <laughs> and so I got my attention by saying things were outrageous. I would say to my mom, uh, we came from a Jewish family. I'm not religious at all. I'm a cultural Jew. I like the food sometimes, except for kreplach. Kreplach is awful. <laughs> Never had it. So, uh, don't, you won't <laughs> like it. So I would say to my mom, I'm a Christian. And my mom would say, what do Christians believe? And I'd say, I don't know. She said, okay, I want a book report by tomorrow evening on Christianity and what the core beliefs are. If you don't give it to me, you can't go outside and play. If you give it to me and it's good, I'll give you a silver dollar. Back then money was silver, you know, not just paper. And so this is how I got attention. And it served me well in, a, in, in my career. But is there a kinder, gentler Paul in there who's not, that, that's, that, that's, that, that's, well, that, that, that kind of, I'm a healer, look. That kind of sits I, back and goes, oh, we really don't like the, the stuff that Ross says. I'm not uh, trying to make you into a Ross multi, is, um, multiple Ross personality. Is, but. Mm, mm, mm. Ross is a useful construct for marketing. Definitely. He's a useful construct for marketing, and he's what guys who are suffering need to have, listen to me, first contact with. They don't want to hear, I'm going to assist you in becoming more emotionally intelligent and have ver requisite variety in the vibe and attitude you show up in, in such a way you have choice and power. They want to hear, get laid now, ask me how. That's what gets your attention. Look, I think it's Tony Robbins who said you can't move someone from where they're not. You have to move them from where they are. And I also, uh, mo most people don't know this. My number one mentor for my career, Richard Bentler. I recently had him on my podcast, The Influencer's Edge, available on all platforms. I had him on my podcast, but my other mentor was Gary Halbert. Gary Halbert taught me how to write copy. And I, I wouldn't be in this business. There would be no seduction community if it weren't for Gary because he taught me how to write copy. And one of the things he said is, don't worry about offending the dogs. Just write what you need to write to attract the foxes. And he said the following things. I'll never forget it. It's made me millions and millions of dollars, almost none of which I get, <laughs> but I did make a lot of money. Gary taught me no one has time to try to figure out your pathetic subtlety. And that really stuck with me. What you were saying about the myth 
of Ross Jeffries yes. and how that was uh, an outcry from the collective unconsciousness. I believe that. It, it actually makes a lot of sense. My question is, what do you think took so long? Like, it's actually when you look back at it, you it seems like somebody would have come up with this before. I mean, you've heard of great seducers throughout history, but no one was really out there my, teaching it. My cocky answer is no one has my, no one can match my level of genius. But I'll tell you what I really think. What I really think is that I came along in the exact perfect storm, the exact moment the internet was just being born. Mm -hmm. And TV chat shows were at their height. So I had the vehicle and the platforms to do it. If it were 10 years earlier than that, there would have been no way to reach a mass audience. And there was a guy in the 70s who wrote a book called How to Pick Up Girls by Eric Weber was the guy. Mm. He's, uh, and I read that book in college. I, it was a waste of 10 bucks. No, and then it was interesting how... Uh, but but I, I will, go ahead, ask your question. Well, I was just going to say how uh, mystery came about, um, I don't know, what, 10 about years 1999, later. 1999, 2000. Yeah, and it was sort of like he was... Because I, he didn't use any of your stuff. At least that's what not what he was teaching. I mean, okay, I, 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 it would make sense. But he is a great hypnotist, and he doesn't know it. I would agree with that too. Um, but it was interesting how the that was sort of paralleling what you were doing. You were, you were already there. I'm, I'm assuming he came across your stuff probably before that. But probably sure. I just found it was interesting because whenever I first started hearing about this, I was like, wait a minute, this is a seduction community, and it's not Ross. But you didn't have as the community that they had, they started doing the forums and started really like, no, they came no, out like that. No, 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 When the internet first started, there was no World Wide Web. We started on Usenet. I don't know if you don't remember no. Usenet. Usenet were basically internet bulletin boards. We had alt dot, so, soch dot singles. And so I had a student, a computer hacker, who knew the late Kevin Mitnick, a very famous computer hacker. Anyway, my student, we'll call him LP. My student, very, very skilled computer hacker. He came into one of my seminars with the intent of proving me a fraud, but he found that my stuff worked. It, for him, it was like, instead of hacking a computer, it was hacking a woman's brain. So he forged a control message and created alt.seduction.fast on all the servers all over the world. And we would have the changes there. That happened for like two years. And then he came along and he said, you should get on the web. I said, what? He said, the World Wide Web, you should get on that. I said, what the fuck is that? And he showed me. And then that's when we got seduction.com, where my product can still be found today. <laughs> Speaking of that, what do people need to understand in order to be great seducers and great persuaders? That's a mouthful of question. <laughs> To be great seducers, yeah. they first and foremost, I think they need to control their state. They need to be able to create a state that is uninvested in the outcome and that's joyfully process oriented. They need to be invested in the skills, but just interested in the woman. In a breakfast of bacon and eggs, the chicken is interested, the pig is invested. So that's the first thing. The second thing is, if they're really, my most successful students, the things they have in common is they enter it with the attitude of curiosity and how far can I push this and how much fun can I have learning this? They're able to set aside their conventional ways of thinking long enough to take on new understandings, to take on different ways of thinking, to take on a magnificent new direction in how they think. So that's the first thing. Second thing is they need to understand the fundamental principles of how language patterns work. And the third thing is, this is crucial. They have to have a really good learning strategy. Many people in different areas of persuasion, whether it's sales, seduction, whatever, they think it's a confidence problem, and that could be true, but often it's a bad learning strategy. They're inadvertently programming the mistakes back into their head. Mm. I'll tell you how this works. So let's say a guy is a 30-year-old virgin, which I get, and he keeps asking the self, himself the question, why do I keep screwing it up with women? And all he does is, in his mind, consciously or unconsciously, focus on everything he's done wrong. He's focusing on the ineffective behaviors. Now the brain can't tell the difference between what you repeat over and over again as you dwell on it 
from what you program back in. And naturally it's going to do what you program it in. So it's a vicious cycle of ineffective behavior, dwelling on it, programming it back in ineffective behavior. That's more in helplessness. And most guys don't see that. They just see they're not getting results or they don't feel confident. Mm. So I come along in my seminars and in my products and in my private coaching, which you can find um, seduction.com. <laughs> uh, enough of that. I'm just uh, <laughs> I'm screwing with you. Yeah. yeah. So they need to have a really good learning strategy. That's really, really important. And you know what always bothered me when I would go to self-improvement seminars? Everyone would say, just learn from every experience. But very few people actually tell you how to learn from every experience, particularly in an area of life that's very emotionally charged and has a lot of pain attached to it, a lot of sadness. Mm -hmm. The more of an emotional charge, the less easy it will be to learn from those mistakes. So one of my claims to fame that no one else in that whole pickup seduction industry does is I have a methodology of learning from errors that doesn't involve dwelling on mistakes. And that's something that is like a, a training or is it's that? It's part of, it's part of, well, I don't do uh, group seminars anymore. They're too exhausting. So is that something you can reveal to us or do you have to? What? The, the, <laughs> what? The actual process the strategy, of learning? The learning strategy. First of all, you have to put yourself in an altered state. Self-hypnosis, uh, whatever it is. There's all sorts of, you know this, you, you're well familiar with mm. altered states and hypnosis. Trance can be accessed in many different ways. Mm. And then you have to build in as part of that certain beliefs. Uh, this is, I'm not trying to be evasive here. It's a long, exhaustive explanation. Yeah. So can you give me an example of a belief that you'd want to program in? Yeah. I'll either get what I want or I'll enjoy the process of learning what I need to get what I want or better. That's a great belief. That's a really great belief. Yeah. Another one is anything seemingly or actually painful that comes up is only coming up to be handled, healed, learned from, released, and then purified as energy and focus for me to achieve my goals. That's not a really nice one. Would you say there, there are secrets to seduction or is that just good copy? Of course there's secrets to seduction. And do you put them all out there? Of do course I do. The... No, I don't withhold anything. Mm -hmm. I withhold nothing. I'm not the, um, what's the word my teacher Shinzen Young calls the teacher with the Acharya Mushti, the hand, the fist that withholds secrets. No, I teach everything I know. Interesting, because I, I have come across NLP teachers who don't, and they're very... Uh, what's the point? Why are you doing that? What do you, why would you withhold? I think, I think, I mean, I'm not one of them, but that they, for one, are worried that you might use it against them. Something like that if you decided to go dark, you know. Uh, and then the other one is that they like to have this kind of, it, it might not even be real, but they kind of position themselves or prop themselves up like, yes, I have secrets and I'm not telling you. So I know, I, yeah. um, I know the initials of some of them. <laughs> Yeah. So uh, that's, I mean, I think that shows that if you're not, if you're willing to share everything, that's what a true teacher is. You yeah. know, someone who's willing to Thank share. Thank you. And my whole thing over and over and over, the thing that I get in emails are, you're the greatest teacher of my life. That is what gives me the most fulfillment is to hear you're the greatest teacher I've ever met. That's what I want when I go. And uh, I think, I don't know if I want to be buried. I think I want my body be, to be thrown to vultures or something, to be eaten and torn alive, torn dead or alive. But somehow I want the message to get out there. He was the best teacher I ever met. And what about you? My father was a teacher, among other things. Oh, nice. So was mine. So is, well, he was, he's still alive. I don't yeah. want to make it sound like he was uh, passed on. Well, I'm also a profoundly good healer, but that's where I come up against NLP's rigidity. So many NLP practitioners are so in love with it. They won't even consider the possibility that there are other modalities that work just as well, or if, and also sometimes better depending on the challenge. Mm. I don't think NLP is the be all and end all. I don't, I just don't. I think some of the presuppositions of NLP are bullshit. I don't think that people always have a positive intent for every behavior. You don't think so if you go deep no, enough? No, absolutely not. Hitler had no positive intent. I believe that evil, metaphysical evil, actually exists in the world. Hmm. It's not just people who are in pain or acting out trauma. They're fucking evil. So there are those people. Pol Pot. 
fucking evil. Hitler, fucking evil. Stalin, fucking evil. Yeah, there's we're psychopaths, right? I mean, there's something wrong with them. Uh, or they're just, they know that what they're doing is evil. They enjoy it. And that's how I would define evil. But you could probably say, so like the presuppositions are not beliefs, the presuppositions of NLP. And I know some people do take them on as beliefs and I would say, no, that's not the, that's not the spirit of the presuppositions. It's more about, it's just a, a way to sort of apply to reality, apply to other people. And as a result, it's probably gonna work out better for you, but you don't have to believe it to the extent that like when you see it in front of you, going the opposite way, of course you acknowledge it and adjust and, and adapt. Yeah, it's, uh, you know, some of NLP's marketing <laughs> is just crap. <laughs> like the idea that you can sell genius to the masses. I, 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 get, the, I get the basic, the modeling strategies, tra strategies are great. People confuse, and Richard has said this over and over and over, NLP is not about the trail of techniques. It's about the way of thinking and the modeling technology from which the excuse me the techniques distill out and are extracted from. I think one of the reasons he liked me early on is he saw that I got it and he saw that I was interested not so much in the details of what he was teaching, but in his the way he thinks. Very early on, when I went, I would watch videos of Richard before I went to seminars. And I noticed this, and I noticed in his seminars. This is back in the days, he'd sit on a stool, he'd have a leather vest and he'd be talking and you know, I can't do my Richard kind of like this. And, and uh, he would say some things, techniques and the way this works. And then he would turn to the left and talk to someone who's not there. And he'd say, but the way I really think about it. And that was my cue to pay attention. I remember taking my former, former business partner to a seminar, I said, watch. From time to time, Richard will turn and look to his left and talk to someone who's not there. And he wasn't looking to a camera because there's no camera there and there's no angle that would show him looking looking into it. And I'd be, I, I noticed those things. A few things you could just give some, give people that right now they could go and apply that would make them either more persuasive or more seductive, something sure. very simple. Sure, absolutely. So <laughs> learn to ask different questions. I wish I could bring your Wi-Fi camera and demonstrate it. You but, want to? <laughs> no. You think it's safe? <laughs> no. no then, but, okay. but if I were to, I could look at her and do it, probably. But I, I, let's say most people, the common question is, what do you what do you like to do for fun? I'm, I'm looking off camera at your wife. You've heard that question, right? What do you like to do for fun? It's a stupid question because it doesn't require a response from the imagination and from the deeper part of our consciousness. But instead, I would say, when you want to do something that makes you feel totally alive and get your heart beating hard and time flies by, what do you love to do? Or what's something that you've always dreamed of doing, fantasized about doing, but haven't built up the courage yet to dare? That's a much better question, is it not? Yeah. So uh, wait, wait, hold on. Okay. But the first one is just a factual answer. But the second one requires that they go into trance just listening to it mm -hmm. and they dive deep into the part of their mind where they fantasize and they keep their indulgence, their thoughts about what they like to indulge in, what would frighten them, but they're still attracted to it, all that stuff, just by changing the nature of the question. Now, what if you were in a, like a high ticket sales yeah. conversation? What would be an example of, I don't know, a good question to ask? Like I would ask a question that's loaded with vague, confusing language and has a lot of suggestions in there. Can you give sure. us an example? Sure. That sounds interesting. So, you know, Damon, as you're sitting there, I don't know all the ways you might find yourself growing more and more fascinated about what we're going to be sharing today. But can I please ask you to promise me one thing? Sure. Will you promise me you'll share the questions that naturally arise when a great decision is being made? Whoa, okay. <laughs> I was, uh, okay, no, that's good. That's really that's good. That's real good. Now, yeah. I, this is, uh, I'm serious. I work with clients. I had a client who 20 x his sales in, I trained him four months. I shit you not. You can go to paulrossresults.com and see that. And another guy uh, who runs a company I won't mention his name, but what he does is he works with what they call passport bros. 
You know what passport pros are? They're guys who are tired of American women. They want to live in other countries, have multiple passports. And so he sells high ticket coaching programs to those people. Mm. He's got a $7,000 program, do it with you. And then 25,000, do it for you. And I increased his sales by 500, close to 550% in 90 days. Wow. Showing them these kind of techniques because these techniques, what I just said to you, I can even repeat it pretty close. You know, Damon, as we continue to talk together, I'm not sure all the ways you might stop and find yourself getting really excited about what it is you really want this. But as that's taking place, will you promise me one thing? Sure. Will you promise me you'll ask the questions that naturally arise when a great decision is being made? Now that's so vague, mm -hmm. when you're vague, whatever you can get your prospect to imagine for themselves will be perceived by them as being their own thought and therefore they will not resist it. And the ways to do that are being vague because the unconscious mind will fill in the blank, as you know, by being confusing, because confusion creates a temporary state of suggestibility. As we know, Milton Erickson, the father of modern hypnotherapy, used confusion techniques all the time, or by implying it. So when I say, I don't know all the ways, all implies multiple ways. Mm -hmm. So I use three different techniques there to create that suggestible state. And I did one more thing that was really clever. I didn't say the decision to sign up with me today. I said a great decision is being made. Well, that's very big. Being made by who? What do they call that? Lost performative or? Yeah, being made by who? Yeah, what's the, I would flunk an NLP <laughs> jargon test. I would maybe get a C minus. Mm -hmm. What do they call it when you leave out who's the operator, who's doing it, who's the subject? Who's well, there's the, the lost performative and then there's lack of a re referential index. No, missing referential index, referential, right? Yeah. A great decision's being made. And you'll see them go like that. <laughs> That's a sign that they're, and I'll do this. Just a <laughs> little on F, and when I see them go, I know I got him. I can almost hear it over the phone. Or if I have a recorded video, even though I'm not there. Yeah, just like you did just there. <laughs> okay, so is that manipulation? What, uh, well, I knew this would come up. Yeah, yeah absolutely gonna... it's manipulation. Okay, and, okay. It's very cleverly crafted manipulation. But there are two sides to manipulation. Mm -hmm. There's a side of manipulation that I would agree is dark. And that includes the following element just lying about facts, saying that you own a mansion when in fact you live in a tenement, concealing material facts. So you're selling a car and you don't tell people about the exploding gas tank, pushing down on people's pain buttons, fear, shame, guilt, coercion. Do this or I'll show, I'll show everyone those photos of you, the Dalmatian, the dildo, and the tub of jello. <laughs> I'm not doing any of that. For me, my style of manipulation, influence, persuasion is simply opening up the person's consciousness and building states of consciousness through the way I use my language. That's it. What if someone said, yeah, well that, but that is manipulation because you're yeah. jumping beyond. Is it manipulation? That's fine. Is it yeah. manipulation when the surgeon uses a scalpel? He's manipulating that thing. It, look, every time you, may I reach for your pen for a minute? Okay. I'm manipulating this pen. I'm using my forefinger and my thumb. They're working in opposition. But that's not a Hold on a minute. I'll get there. <laughs> They're working in opposition to and cooperation with. They're working paradoxically. When paradox, there's power. Now, let's get back to your question. It's moving a person's consciousness. I get it. But it's not doing the other kind of manipulation. I'm not telling a lie. I'm not concealing a material fact. I'm not pushing down on pain buttons, pain buttons, excuse me. And I'm not using coercion. So where's the harm? So would you say you're using it to move them in a positive direction? It just happens to be a direction you want them to go. But in my case, yes. Yeah. But could you use it? In, uh, there, listen, there are more effective ways to, to manipulate people than what I do in, in terms, if you want to move people to do things, uh, I want to get sued by a certain church, but they do that. They have techniques for doing it that mm -hmm. do not involve any of what I do. Would it be fair to say if you use it responsibly 
then everything's cool. We're good. It's not, it doesn't violate any morals or ethics that, in, in your opinion, I mean, there's always somebody who could say, well, it does and this and that. But I mean, in general, you don't feel bad about what you're doing. You, you can sleep I well do. at night. You I love what right. I do and yeah. I love the results that my clients get. When someone comes along, to, and I was joking about Paul Ross results, but you really can't see it there. When uh, So one of my clients uh, was a very, really good guy. He was a, a mortgage loan officer. A guy by the name of Fabian, I can say his name because his testimonial is up there. Fabian had a family of two kids and a wife to support. He was making $1,500 a month in commissions. He had to drive Uber to help pay the bills. And he was worried sick. Can I put food on the table for my kids? So in four months, using what I taught him, I did two calls, three calls a month on Zoom. There weren't calls. Mm. I took him from 1500 a month to just over 30,000 a month. I changed his life. He stopped drinking because he was no longer under financial stress. It saved his marriage. So I don't feel bad about that at all. Now he paid me a nice hefty sum. Once he got to the $30,000, I started taking a percentage. This is as effective as you're saying it is. Why don't more people learn it? I just need to spread the word and market it better. Hmm. This is just That's why I'm doing thing. this interview. It's in my own self-interest. But do you think there's a level of people saying, oh, this really And you work? have to be smart. You can't be a dumb shit. It's one of my fail states. You cannot be stupid and do my stuff. It's sophisticated. It's not meant for people who want to wear big fuzzy hats and platform shoes and uh, goggles and the rest of it. You're talking about seduction, not persuasion. <laughs> yes. Sales, sales and that but even so, yeah. you have to be smart to do this stuff. You can't be an idiot or it's just not going to work. And you have to understand the foundational core principles. You can parrot what I say and get tremendous results. No doubt about it. But when you get the principles and the foundations, then you can mix and match and come up with your own stuff. There's nothing that pleases me more when I was doing seduction group seminars, when a student would come up and say, Ross, I got a variation on your pattern. What do you think? I'd say, get the fuck up on stage and teach this. This is better than what I'm teaching. Nothing makes uh, Papa prouder than when his kids, his children surpass him. <laughs> That's, but there's not a lot of teachers or I don't call them real teachers, but it's not a lot of people who are, are like that, who teach. It's more about their own ego. And if somebody is doing something better, they feel like they're being upstaged and you don't feel that. No. Yeah. That's good. No. I mean, that's a sign I'm of a teacher. genuine teacher. Yeah. So what about people say, well, all this NLP stuff is bullshit. All that what you're teaching is bullshit, whether it's seduction or persuasion. Great. That's more women, more money for me. I don't care. You can't convince everyone. For that matter, you just waste your energy. It's a principle of marketing. Mm -hmm. So you just don't waste your time with that? No. Yeah. Hell of them. Um, Let them burn in hell in a fetid pit of semen forever. <laughs> so this might be a, a little sensitive topic uh -oh, for you. Gotcha. But, uh, gotcha. Here comes a gotcha. Yeah. How did you feel about when you found out that Tom Cruise was portraying you in a movie? I thought it was fantastic. <laughs> You weren't disappointed they didn't find somebody better looking? <laughs> oh, well, that's a good, 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 hit that softball. <laughs> that no, he's, he's huh? much shorter than I am. He's right, like 5'5", five, yeah. five, I'm 6'2". No, but that, that movie brought me so much publicity. So were you sitting there watching the movie and then you were like, hey, that's me? Or did somebody No, what me? happened? My, someone told me that this movie was about to come out. I don't remember exactly how I learned about it, but I went to my intellectual property lawyers, nice big firm in LA, charged me a tremendous amount of money to protect my trademarks and my copyrights. And I had a thing for one of the lawyers, Janine, and she would not, she wasn't having it because I was a client. I said, Janine, now you have to come to the movies with me because they could be infringing my trademarks. And she said, Okay. But as soon as Tom came out with that, dun, dun, 2000, and he said, respect the cock, I lost it. I was laughing so hard, I fell out of my chair. It was fun, and I just laughed hysterically. Now, the I believe I read an article, because I wanted to know more about this, and yeah. I was actually a film student at the time that this movie came out. I was a big fan of Paul Thomas Anderson. Paul Thomas Anderson's and a genius. It. Yeah, and then he was asked about it, and at and first he, de he denied it at first. 
And then later he said, well, yeah, I used to watch, I guess you did commercials locally in LA. No, you know, no, no, no. I don't know about the version you got, but I don't know that he ever denied it. I just saw it in creative screenwriting where he said, I based, I heard these two engineers, a tape of these two engineers talking about a problem when it was having with women. And the other one said, well, Ross Jeffries would say, respect the cock. And then PTA thought, who the hell is Ross Jeffries? And then he looked me up and did some research. Now, Tom Cruise vociferously denied it when Neil brought it up. He mm. said, that guy is not Mackie. I created that character with PTA. Yeah, but where did it come from? Right? It came from me. Yeah. I don't think Tom knew he was playing a character. He thought he was playing a real person. So there's art imitating art, imitating life. So I don't know how that Ouroboros works. Yeah, there's a book that's considered the pickup artist Bible. That is uh, the game, oh. which you're in. Mm -hmm. And how did you feel about your, how you were portrayed well, in that book? I made so much money from people still Google me to this day. They read that book, The Game, and they see Ross Jeffries, and Neil called me the godfather of seduction. He talks about how I got that waitress, the waitress is fighting over me using anchoring, and a sliding anchor. You understand mm -hmm. what it is. Mm -hmm. They didn't understand the book. With a sugar packet. Mm -hmm. Oh, so that was a sliding anchor. Yeah, it was a sliding oh, anchor. Oh, because I didn't understand. I was like, that was kind of strange. I but... anchored sexual feelings to the sugar packet, and then I split it closer to her. It was a sliding anchor. Ah, right, okay. You get the trick. Yeah. You're the, we're magicians talking about how you levitate the lady. We, we <laughs> can talk shop here. Yeah, so I made so much money off that, off that book. And I occasionally had people hand me the book and say, would you sign this? I always sign the same thing. I did not write this book. <laughs> now, so, the way I was portrayed, different story. Mm -hmm. So, let's, tell me about that. Well, first of all, Neil's a great writer. Mm -hmm. I'll give it to him. He's a genius writer. He sensationalized a lot of my <laughs> more annoying traits. They're, they're accurate, but he mm -hmm. put a magnifying lens on them. He totally left out the aspect of me that really loved and cared about my students and was invested in healing my students. He didn't write about that at all. And he also attacked my students. He called them greasy fools. That's not fair. You wanna throw shit at me? I put my neck out there as a public figure. I say things to get attention, get people to throw garbage at me. That's fine. You don't take shots at my students who are absolutely innocent and have no chance, no voice to speak back. That was not good. I called him up on the phone. I said, that's bullshit. You don't do that. And he gave me, you know, you're right. When they, if they ever do a paperback version, I'll make sure they cut it out. He's full of shit. What about the Carmen Electra sniffing her butt on being all, on all fours? Did that actually happen? <laughs> okay. <laughs> I was trying to sniff her crotch and she turned around. So uh, what happened there is I wanted, I was making a joke because metaphorically, Everyone was kissing her ass anyway. They were fawning all over her. And I thought, let me show these idiots what they're doing. So that's what I did. Yes, that happened. Wow. So you didn't get her number that night? <laughs> um, I don't get some. numbers. I create states of arousal, desire, fascination. I future pace them already being in bed with me. Then the number becomes a, a punctuation mark, not the conversation. And how did you become the most seductive man alive? Which is your title for this piece? I don't come on. You gotta have a better answer than that. No, you that's my answer. Come on, come I'm the on. best seduction teacher. I don't believe I'm the best seducer. Who's the best seducer? <laughs> Neil, Neil Who knows? <laughs> no. No, he's a no. 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 Was he? Good? I don't know. Was uh, he actually good? Ah, uh, he's a good student. I never actually saw any. Saw him do any of it. I saw the results. I saw his girlfriend at the time, who he cheated on. <laughs> His fiance, I think he cheated on her too. Yeah, I know you wrote a book about him called yeah. The Truth. Yeah. yeah. So you never actually saw That's that. amazing that an inveterate liar and cheater would write a book called The Truth. I think that's pretty ironic. So you, you would actually go that far to say he's a liar? That I mean, he writers embellish people and, you know, everybody embellishes if you're out there in the public, you're trying to sell something. So would you say it was all, all I would lies? say that Neil gets off on betraying people. Think about what he did in the game. He betrayed him. He didn't tell people he was writing a book. He betrayed himself as a student and a friend and all that. And all the while he was writing a book. Did he ask you permission? No. Like to portray you or write? No. no. 
And though, although towards the end of his tutelage with me, I said, you know, Neil, you should write a book about the community to make a great book. He was already writing the book. He said, I'll talk to my publisher about that. So he probably chuckled on the inside and bit his, bit his cheeks. Did you start teaching seduction before or after you learned NLP? Or did you start after. using it? So it was after. after. Now you wrote a book about how to get women you desire into bed. Oh, you're speaking about... The very first one. Yeah. Did, uh, so I'm not going to look at the camera another time. I've already <laughs> done that on that one. Did, uh, but didn't that come before you learned NLP? Or did no, it come, it's that NLP after? techniques in there. Oh, I don't remember. Okay, it seemed like when I re read that book, I don't remember there being NLP techniques, but sure. it, actually at the time I wasn't NLP trained, so that might yeah. have been why. Yeah. Okay, so you... You learn it's it funny, I should have brought, I have one copy, there's one copy in existence of the original version of the book. Very humble start. <laughs> Very funny, it was like 90 pages, I think, and it was glued, it was just cardboard paper, and it was glued together with like red glue, red backing, and there was a stencil drawing done by my roommate, Mark's, girlfriend jenny it's just a, it's just absolutely cheap and ridiculous but here's the thing when i went on talk shows i thought i can't show that book no one's going to buy it so i invested pretty much all the money i had and had a handmade leather bound gold lettered cover book and i would have the host show that book and i'd say you gotta give it back to me it's the only copy i have <laughs> And how well did that sell? I mean, it was your first product, right? Uh, so I don't remember the numbers, but it did well, but I was spending all the money. So I got, uh, I put ads in the back of Playboy. No, Playboy was too expensive. The magazine that made money for me is defunct now. It was called Gallery Magazine. It was sort of mid-level. Pornography magazine? No, not pornography, an occasional beaver shot, but it was a men's magazine. And I came up with that. I wrote the ad again. Kudos to Gary Halbert, my late mentor. He was a, he was a giant, an absolute giant, as big a giant in, in the copywriting world as Bandler or Grinder Award to, to what they did. Gary influenced my mind. I would not be where I am. The seduction community would not exist without Gary Halbert, but I'm sure he would laugh at that. Gary thought I was a total fraud. He said, your seminars is big fat virgins lying to each other by getting late, but your marketing is brilliant. I wrote this ad. The ad said the amazing seduction secrets of a skinny, ugly, six-foot geek from mm -hmm. Culver City, California that could get you all the hot, sexy women you ever want, no matter your looks, social status, status or age, or it's free. That sold books like crazy. How would you define seduction in your terms, not, not like a textbook definition, but... It is the art of creating states of consciousness through which the woman looks at you and naturally gives you the behavior that you want to get. You're not focused on the behavior. You're focused on creating states, emotional states, states of consciousness, altered states of focus, fascination, desire, incredible connection. And the way I teach is to use language patterns in a way that I can demonstrate some of these lines. It's kind of weird doing that. You can, <laughs> Look at her, but she's not going to start liking you, is she? <laughs> she might. No, I don't want to demonstrate it. You know, like, okay. Do you think all of the great seducers throughout history, that that's what they were based on? I mean, it's all seduction no, based on states. No, 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 no. I think they appealed to ego and vanity and then they push pull. And I'll ask you this question. What do you think is the most widely published and best-selling genre of fiction. Science fiction? No. Nope. Take one. Roman, of romance. Romance yeah. novels. Yeah, yeah. And they're always about a guy named Selig Hardrod. And he you can't tell, is he a good guy or a bad guy? Or he's a bad guy. And the woman overcomes Selig's nasty nature with her love and brings out his true nature of being a good guy. Or he helps her explore her dark, perverted side. Fifty Shades of Grey. Mm more Fifty Shades of Deeper Grey. There's an incredibly funny, I think the Wayans Brothers did it, called Fifty Shades of Black. <laughs> it was hilarious. Is it about the, the drama for these seducers? They're not what I do. Not what you do, but these other seducers you're saying is that it's more about that adventure, that story, the narrative, the whole thing that yeah. pulls them in. And yeah, that's... yeah. Okay, but you don't do that. No. You go straight to states. I'm gonna be, look at this face. <laughs> From this angle, from this angle, from this angle, do I look like a selling hard rod to you? 
<laughs> I look like a Jaime Schwartz is what I look like. So are you... I can make that joke because I'm Jewish. <laughs> and so are you still pretty active in dating? I just broke up with my 29-year-old and I'm 64. 65, excuse me. Mm. And so... I had to fire her. So you're back on the market. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I guess you can put it that way. So what, what's what's that going to be like for you, I don't know, in the next few days? Are you going to go out sarging and... and... <laughs> sarging. <laughs> So how does it work for you now? <laughs> was that good? That was a good joke. That was funny. <laughs> yeah, um, so how do you, so, I mean, you're not going to just sit at home alone. You, you've got all these skills, I'm these abilities. I'm very busy. I could open my phone and show you my calendar. Well, thank you for making the time to do that. Oh, I love this. Are you kidding me? Okay. Sure. <laughs> so, um, yeah. So I'd rather it? have a Swedish beauty sit on my face, but this isn't bad. Maybe we can do it simultaneously. It's close, right? It's Your close. wife is like turning red and cracking up. <laughs> so, like... What are you going to do now? I mean, you're not going to, I mean, how long are you going to go before you actually start dating again? Or, I mean, I don't know. You I'm, see an attractive listen, woman, you just go for it. And I'm, I'm exhausted from doing a weekend. I don't do weekends anymore with private clients with this guy. God love him was uh, just like pulling teeth. I like to sarge, as you put it, and uh, high end grocery stores, like stores, Whole Foods and that sort of thing. That's, mm. that's my place. And if you want a real secret, guys, go to yoga events, not the yoga classes because they get up and leave, but events at yoga studios. Like there's one being offered. It's called Hypno Breathwork. It's a special workshop. I'm all over that because the women are going to be in trance, super suggestible, interested in what it is I do. So let me so that's, you're, that's you're, like putting the wolf in the hen house. So you're dating 20 year olds. And I, she's almost, she was almost 30. She was almost 30. But it's not fair to but, say 20 year olds. Well, she's 20, or she's 29. Okay, so, but like, do they, when you come on to them, or you introduce Come yourself, on to them? I'm just saying everything wrong here. Um, when you approach them, that's fair. I never approach. I only extend opportunities to connect with me in fun and power. That's what I meant by approach. <laughs> it's, a, it's an important why, distinction. Why? why it's, when I say I approach a woman, what does that imply? Who does it imply has the value? I can see what you mean, that she has a value. Yeah. When I say I never approach, I only joyfully offer opportunities to connect with me in fun and powerful ways. It changes, the the metaphor is completely different. It changes what I visualize. It changes the flow of feeling in my body. It changes my approach in terms of how she responds. I'm offering a gift. So if I'm, I, even if, the, I'm not saying I'm God's gift to women. I don't believe in God. Ooh, ah. What I am saying is that my energy, my positivity, my masculinity, that's also joyous, a joyous masculinity is very rare. Most people think that to be masculine, you have to scowl or not smile. I believe you have to be grounded on the one hand to be masculine, but then if you're not joyous and expansive, then you're just stone cold. So when you combine those two things, when you can be joyous and extend, we, we were just talking before the shoot, extend your boundary, mm -hmm. but remain grounded and rooted into the earth. Mm -hmm. That's very attractive and it's a gift. Yeah. So by the time you're, you start to move things along, I'm just going to say, I can say, I know whatever word I'm I use here. Go yeah, for it. Right I word. don't care. Uh, and they're that young. Do they go? I think 29 is really that young, but okay. I mean, it's 30. Six years, thirty-six years hey, old. My record is forty-three years. Okay, so when you're approaching, and yeah. when, whether or not she starts dating you or not, I'm you actually know? looking. Believe it or not, I am looking for a life partner at this point. I'm sixty-five. Yeah, you know, I can't be running around sarging, and I'm busy, and my business is thriving and burgeoning, and continue to grow. So that has to be someone in their mid to late thirties who's been through the ringer. That she's made her peace with men. Mm. So she's made her peace with men as much as any woman can, because men can be fucktards. She has some way to emotionally regulate herself, to emotionally self-regulate. She has really good communication skills, meaning if she's angry at me, she can express it without pointing her finger and name calling me. Mm -hmm. I, I don't do well with emotional violence. She has something that she loves in her life that's not me. I, someone who has a talent that I don't have, like an artist or a musician, that's great. Or she's a healer. She's in the healing professions, doctor, nurse, something like that. So I have criteria. You notice I didn't say they have to be hot. I would rather be with someone who other people would rate as a seven or 7.5, 7 
who has all those characteristics I just explained mm -hmm. than a trophy. I don't need trophies. I'm too old for Are you trophies. going soft on me here? No, I'm just telling you what I want. <laughs> so what Not what I want, what I claim. Look at the difference between those two words. I don't say I want that woman. I say I claim my woman who has these qualities, who I will also enhance equally as she enhances me. So are you saying? And finally, she has to understand being on my team. What she has to understand teamwork. What okay. does it mean, you know, have my back, ride or die with me? So I want to jump back uh, to when you're talking to these women who are much younger than you. Mm -hmm. Do you get them worked up into such a good state that they're like ready to ask you out? Or do you go ahead and say, hey, let's go have coffee? And they I always have one trick up my sleeve. I invite, uh, whether she's uh, 25 or 45 or whatever it is, I invite women to breakfast. It's the best first. I hate the word date. I gag on the okay, word Okay, so date. you need to leave the room. <laughs> she loves breakfast, so she... Uh, why? What's wrong with that? No, because you're... <laughs> well, I'm speaking her language. Yeah, no, see? exactly. Isn't that a great first date? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, see, you have confirmation from your yeah. lovely wife. Breakfast is fantastic. So, do, wait, yeah, well, let me finish. You won't let me ask this question. Ask, <laughs> ask. You're do hammering they, on the younger woman. Yeah, thing. well, I want to know. Do they think it's Try and get me in the corner, man. Yeah, I'm no, I'm trying. Do, do they think Float it's like weird? Do they think it's weird? And they go, wait a minute. No, you're, you're nope. too old for me. No. Uh, no? Never had a problem. Never had happened. No. It's breakfast. When they when they realize that you're hitting on them. or that I they, don't hit on anyone. That What a violent metaphor. Okay. No, 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 no. I'm not kidding. Yeah. Words are powerful. I don't hit I'm speaking anyone. in a language that everybody can understand. Well, right. they need to upgrade, Okay, don't they? When she realizes you're into her and that you want to progress this thing and she's much younger. And some women are not going to be interested. Maybe 60% yeah. aren't. I don't care. Maybe 70% are not interested in a guy of this age. Who cares? I don't well, care. It doesn't mean anything to me. I'm not saying I don't sure, care. I'm just curious. Damn, I don't care one bubbly squirrel fart. <laughs> to use a metaphor, a colorful metaphor. I don't care one bubbly squirrel fart if some young woman is interested in me. So, uh, okay, I move on to the next one. So you play the numbers on top of it. It's not a numbers game if you understand the overall principles and the underlying rules that make things work. I simply don't, cons I don't, uh, like, so what? Okay, changing subjects here. What did you do before you were teaching seduction? <laughs> For a living. That's a knee slapper. I did more than one thing. Well, how far back do you want to go? Well, what was like your main, I guess? I was a paralegal. I was paralegal? a litigation. I was a very good litigation paralegal. Uh, my boss has always called me the paralegal from hell. I think everyone should take a uh, 90 day to four month, six month paralegal training. So you understand how the litigation process works. I did civil lit and I worked as a civil litigation paralegal. Uh, I was really, really good at it. They billed me at $150, $200 an hour. That's how they billed the client. They paid me 15 to 20. And so but I loved it. I was very good at it. So that seemed like the direction you were heading. I wanted to be a lawyer and then I stumbled onto NLP and all this stuff. And I thought, wait, this stuff works. I could make a fortune and, and do this. It's much more fun. So that was the reason. There actually came a point. Uh, let me tell the story. There came sure. a point where I was doing all the TV chat shows at the time, talk shows, and came to a point where I was losing money going into work. I said to my boss, Teresa, I said, Teresa, I love working for you. You're the best boss I've ever had, but I can't stay here. It's costing me money to come into the office. She said, Paul, if you want to go, you can go now. I said, no, I owe you two weeks. And I gave her the two weeks. I remember driving out of the garage. I turned to my security credential. And I drove out of the garage and I drove, I lived in Marina, Culver City at the time, but I drove to Marina Del Rey and I took my electronic parking car key and I just threw it into the water, which I shouldn't have done, polluting the water with plastic. Mm -hmm. And then that Sunday night, I was driving back from my sister's house in Beverly Hills and looking at all the traffic and I thought, look at all these poor people, they have to go to work tomorrow. I don't. That was a great feeling. I'm done. That was a liberation feeling. What was the moment, I'm fishing for a story here, but if there's not one, then maybe it's just not that mm -hmm. big of a deal. Uh, sure. That moment where you go, I'm gonna teach seduction. That's what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna be a seduction teacher. Interesting, I didn't have the, uh, okay, this is gonna sound like a crazy story, but I swear to you, it's true. Oh, we've, we we hit gold here. <laughs> we hit gold. Nice. So back at, you when I was attending UCLA in University of California, Los Angeles, for those of you who don't know, 
studying political science, it was torture for me because there were like 15,000 gorgeous co-eds, gorgeous co-eds, and I just couldn't get anywhere with any of them. I remember sitting in my classes and looking at all these bodies and thinking, why, my God, why are you doing this to me? I just couldn't get anywhere. So virgin in my college year. I remember walking up the main road, the main sidewalk in UCLA called Bruin Walk and yelling out loud, when am I gonna solve this? And I heard, a, to this day, my voice of intuition is up here. The sum modality is to my left and at an angle and slightly above. You probably shouldn't be telling people that. I don't care. What are they gonna do? Stand over there? I know what they're doing. And I remember it saying, when you solve it for yourself, you'll solve it for everyone. And then I ignored it for 10 years. Take it as truth or take okay. it as a metaphor. No. It's true. I've had some it's not metaphorical, it's yeah. true. I also sense this, and I'm not saying I saw it, I'm not saying I read about it or anything like that. There is a kind of, um, I guess we were talking about uh, healing and the, he, yeah. where does the drive to heal come from? And that would be pain. Incredible pain. Yeah. And so when you touch someone the wrong way, who's in a lot of pain, they react. And so I, I kind of assumed, and you can tell me that or not, or tell me you don't, you don't sure. want to talk about it, but that if somebody rubbed you the wrong way or something like that, there's a hell of a lot of pain that could come out and that would... I know, it's very hard to rub you the, the wrong way. Okay. I'm pretty trend. I don't want to say I'm bulletproof. I'm more like, do you know the Martian Manhunter is? Mm -hmm. He's a superhero. He can change his density so things pass right through him. I'm more like the kind of guy who thinks just pass right through me, like wind through the trees. Which I've only been furious in my life about five or six times. Twice was in defense of my sister who is being um, physically harmed by someone. And I got, I was ready to choke them to death. But that was an instinct. I didn't even have to think about it. Well, I found myself, I didn't think I have to protect my sister. I found myself suddenly at that person's throat. And then uh, the other time was when my mother passed on and I'd been donated to this Jewish tra charity and the rabbi called me and said, come on, give more in your mother's name. And I lost it. I, you mother fucker, you're trying to manipulate me over my grief over my mother. So I've lost it maybe five, six times in my life. Okay. How do you think people perceive you? Which people under what circumstances is measured by whom? Okay, meta modeling, nice. Oh, of um, yeah, I'm sure this is how I think. Yeah, so you put a lot out there that I'm, I'm sure you've heard it. I mean, you've had to have heard it. You go on talk shows and talking about this, and they're not even listening to what you're saying. They're just booing you from the start. Yeah, right? yeah. they're my bitches. <laughs> you don't think about that sometimes? How people are perceiving you? You really don't care? Unless it's a direct and specific marketing position. Have you ever seen those ads on Instagram for I'll get. You, uh, K coaches, I'll show you how to build a hundred thousand dollar a month coaching platform yeah. program, mm -hmm. or I'll work with you. I don't train the coaches. I take those companies and train their sales team and rewrite their copy and rewrite all their emails. So, and their video sales letters. And I take a, I do an upfront feed. Then I take a percentage of the difference over 90 days. There's much more money in that. than you understand that's mm -hmm. not my niche. Okay. But you're perfectly fine being known as the the most seductive man alive. Can I tell you a secret? A huge swath of these younger marketing guys who are like 35, 40, who have these kind of companies in my niche, they almost all know Ross Jeffries. They're huge fanboys. They're in the closet about it. They won't come out and say, I got laid using Ross Jeffries. They tell me that. They say, I can't believe it. You're actually Ross Jeffries. I, oh my God, I read the game when I was 19 and I read your book when I was in high school, it got me late. You're my hero. Of course I'll do business with you. But they just don't want every, everyone to know it. Or I work in the background. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. Do you see a difference in the terms persuasion and seduction? Or to you, is it really the same thing? Seduction and persuade. Seduction is just a subset. It falls in the umbrella of persuasion. Within the category of persuasion. Yeah, healing is also a persuasion. Really? I've never heard anybody say it like that. How so? Well, first and foremost, you have to persuade the person that there's hope for their situation. And then you have to influence their beliefs, change beliefs, what we do in NLP, what we do in hypnosis. It's a form of influence. When I work, when I do hypnotic work with people, the first thing I do, I stole this directly from Milton, Milton Erickson, is to 
tell them stories about how they learned things as a little child. I want to create a learning set for them. That's part of the healing process is doing persuasion and influence and awakening that part of their consciousness. What is the most common misunderstanding about seduction that you come across? That it's designed to harm people. What do you, where do you think that comes from? Because I, that was a, I don't know, one of my kind of like pulling the veil off and being like, yeah, this doesn't, I mean, you can, you can always hurt people doing anything, but that was a big revelation to me. And I, it, to the point where I go back and was like, why did I think it was like a bad or harmful thing? I don't know. I'm not responsible for other people's stupidity and erroneous thinking about what I do. I you never know. thought that yourself until you came to like a new understanding. It nope. was just always, seduction nope. was fine. Yeah. yeah. Was that something that you could openly talk about with your parents and your... They your, loved it. Really? All of they fucking loved it. Really? Oh, yeah. As long as I made money with it, they didn't care. No, my mother always thought that I was a genius. And she once told me, my mother taught me in stories and metaphors. And I remember being very young. I don't recall the age. And my mother said, you're going to grow up to be the Johnny Appleseed of ideas. I said, Mom, who's Mommy? Who's Johnny Appleseed? She said, Johnny Appleseed went around planting little seeds in villages, and then he would come back and they would sprout it into apple trees. You're going to do that with your ideas. You're going to plant your ideas in people's minds. And another time, I was sassier, and she waved her finger at me, and she said, Kid, she would call me Kid when she was mad at me. If you don't knock it off, you'll grow up to be an iconoclast. And I said, What's that, Mommy? And she said, that someone who goes around kicking over other people's sacred ideas and really pissing them off. I'm like, yes, I want to be an iconoclast. I want to grow up to be an iconoclast. You would just openly talk with your parents about uh, your business, your, I mean, seduction. They didn't care. And they didn't care. Yeah. As long as I made money. They were more worried when I was not making money and doing odd jobs and struggling to survive. They didn't care. The only comment I got from my dad is I tried it and it didn't work for me on your mother. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Okay. <laughs> I'm being raw here. So you don't seem to care at all about what other people think, but I, well, the people around me who I deeply love, I care about that. Yeah, I would assume so. But I, I guess I'm, I'm wanting to dig into this and you haven't given me anything. So I'm going to ask it again. What do you say? Well, maybe it's a different question. Maybe it's about more about what you say to people when they come at you and they say, this is manipulative. This is wrong. What you're doing. <laughs> Just laugh in their face. Just nothing no response yeah. you, i'll you say never, yes it is you want to pay me to learn <laughs> <laughs> you never ask them why or what, what are they you know I'll sometimes i'll say what do you mean by manipulation are you aware of how you've been manipulated to believe that manipulation is bad manipulation asking that kind of question is a form of manipulating me now that's manipulation yeah i mean all reflexively applied to the speaker is that the technique yeah that's a that's a technique. When you would go on these talk shows and everything, you just for you that was just you were just having fun. Yeah, I loved it. My thought is the host, you're my bitch. The producer, you're my bitch. The audience, you're all my bitches. I own you. Do you think attractive men don't need to learn seduction? What do you mean by attractive? Define your term. I don't know what people think are generically physically appealing. What does that mean? I'm not joking with you. I'm being okay. serious. No, no, no. What do you no, mean no. by attractive? So, attractive is, my mother would say, attractive is, <laughs> my mother would say, my mother, I know she would say, because she said it, beauty is skin deep, ugly cuts right to the bone. <laughs> I love my mom. <laughs> she was one of my great teachers. I get my sense of humor from my mother. What they call chads and the red pill and uh, you don't know that. Okay, so. Chads, chodes, brads and debbies yeah. or... Brad's, what is it? What's the Brad and who? I don't I just know it as Chad. So it's the guy who is kind of alpha, who is physically what does alpha mean? Yeah, okay. I'm playing yeah. on a different meta. The playing guy field. who is like that in charge, you know, the leading type, uh, the captain of the football team kind of guy who's muscled, handsome. <laughs> I've had guys like that come to me, and the only women they've been with are prostitutes. Pretty much everybody can use seduction skills, not just look, the unattractive. Look. But but you uh, but you market to the unattractive guy. And that's dirty. not true. It's not. That's not no. true. I market to guys who want choice, power, selective selectivity, and a system. They don't want to guess. I have guys who are very successful. I have a client who makes well over five hundred thousand dollars a year. Who's a good-hearted guy. Who's what you would call physically attractive. You know, symmetrical proportions and works out. He's coming out of a 12-year marriage with a traumatic divorce. 
So it's just a horrible stereotype. It's not true. It's not fair to the people who I help. And it's uh, completely incorrect. Well, I didn't mean to imply that you're going after. I don't but know. you did. I'm, pu I'm, I'm pushing a little bit so that you can blow these things That's up. That's fine, but okay. you did mean that. Um, not as, maybe as uh, mean as you might think. That I don't mean. think you're mean, but this okay. doesn't mean another cheese it. <laughs> okay. Should women learn what you teach? Or not. Have you, do you have women come into your trainings? My favorite ex-girlfriend would come to my trainings when I'm to in Europe. She, she knew all this stuff. Guys would, would try it on her. She'd say, I know that pattern. Piss off. What do you think would happen if uh, like an attractive woman would start using this stuff on guys? I mean, she'd be out of control if she wanted to be. Yeah, I'm sure. I mean, that would be a, a force to... Send her my way. <laughs> do you get tired of teaching seduction? I quit teaching groups. I came out of retirement a couple of times. Two years ago, uh, I wanted to do a seminar in San Diego, but I prepared. I went to my doctors down the road, like eighth of a mile down the road. And I said, I need an IV and a ozone treatment every day for this week leading up to Friday. And then uh, I just slept all day Friday, prepped. And then Saturday, uh, one of my doctors, Dr. Fagan came and uh, I said, and I give me a IV on the break. So on Saturday on the break, she held, she just stood there with the IV. Now she hooked it up to something. So that was two years ago. I was able to give a dynamite seminar. I talked the way I did in my forties, but this last time I was just exhausted. It was like Ali at the end of his career. I just, just couldn't do it anymore. I don't have the physical energy to do this. And also many of the guys who come to the live events who came, they were seriously damaged and that's draining. I've earned the right to not have to do that anymore. Did you ever look for a prodigy to bring up and do it? Yeah, like well, the problem is you can't take 30 years of NLP training and put it in someone's head. Yeah, it would take years. It would take years. I don't have the energy of the time. I'm making money doing other things. Look, when you have a 30 year, 30 plus year career and guys keep asking you the same questions, you go numb. Right, you don't want to hear it. Do you respect women? That's a loaded question. What do you mean by respect and which women? Well, I would say there are women who act in ways that are completely where they have, excuse me, no accountability, no deep values. They're seeking validation and attention from everybody. I don't respect people like that. The broader question is what kind of people do I respect, male, female? or any way they self-identify. I think a lot of people would, again, look at what you do. Women would look at what you do. Not Well, not even take the time to really understand. But I really, I, I'm not joking yeah. about that. I really want to, Voltaire said, if you're going to debate with me, you're not debating me, but if you're going to debate with me, you must first define your terms. I really mean it. So I think that's a, a really general term, like you're pointing out. And when people say, they're like, probably would, I think a lot of women and men would look at what you're doing and say, well, he doesn't respect women. I don't know what they mean by that. I really don't. Mm. Women are like I respect you. my sisters. My sisters are terrifyingly powerful. I respect my niece. I'm not, she, I don't think she'd want my name associated with hers, but my nieces spank me you know, metaphorically when it comes to being a business person. She's very famous and she makes millions and millions and millions of dollars. Women in my family are forces to be reckoned with. I profoundly respect uh, the woman who's to this day the love of my life. She's earned my total respect. All the women who've been in relationships with, relationships with me are people I know and respect, but I look up to and admire. If I can't not just respect, but on some level admire, then I can't fall in love with someone. I can love them, but I have to have, there has to be an element of me being able to admire them. You know? Well, do you think the woman you want to fall in love with, that you want to perceive her as being better than you, or is just someone you want to admire? Just someone I can admire. Yeah. This is a curiosity question. That's fine. Do you know Robert Greenos? Of course. 48 right. Laws of Power, 48 and Laws of Attractiveness. The seduction book? Yeah. Had, did you read it? I tried to. Yeah? What happened? I wasn't impressed. He doesn't give any real techniques. That was my... So I love Robert Greene, I want to say first. I think he's an amazing writer. I told him that too. I met him. I saw him. Oh, really? crap. He just looked at me like, what? Really? Yeah. That's all he said? Huh? <laughs> Where did you meet him? I don't remember. Huh? What was it like to be on Dr. Phil? <laughs> Very interesting. I don't yeah. watch what I say here. 
Um, for reasons I, I'll go into off camera. Dr. Phil is a brilliant guy. He acted like a total dick to me. They ambushed me on that show. They made me look like the bad guy. But during the commercial breaks, he was so kind. He has these beautiful blue eyes. He said, this is, this is NLP that you're doing. This dog was <laughs> not He didn't say it, but he said, you're doing NLP. Oh, I'll get it. I understand. That's smart. But as soon as the cameras came on, he switched. You know what happened during Dr. Phil? He said, you know, I, I think this is, a lot of the audience here thinks this is obnoxious what you're saying about women. I said, Dr. Phil, I just say this to get attention. Just like you do, the, the topics of your show are salacious. I mean, this show is heavily edited to get attention. He said, this show is not edited. What you see is real. I turned to the camera and I said, if you people watch at home, don't think this show is structured and somewhat scripted and heavily edited, then I've got Swampland in Florida. And of course they cut that out. What are your thoughts on, you, we brought up Red Pill, but uh, I mean, you, I'm assuming you have to encounter it because a lot of these Red Pill people. I think the problem with Red Pill is they're demonizing one gender to deify another. Uh, you know, when they say things like, uh, women should not be allowed to vote, that's just ridiculous. That's ludicrous. Mm -hmm. And then the Me Too movement, was it uh, a net good for women or a net bad? What do you think? And well, there's some aspects of, of it are good, but then when it encourages people to view themselves as victims, it, when it gets exaggerated to, to I think Me Too metastasized into council culture, political correctness. Like for example, I don't believe that gazing at a woman in a leering way is an act of violence. That's not violence. It's trivializing an actual crime. Do you understand? Or when someone says that show is rapey, it's trivializing a brutal, evil, awful crime. So yes, I, for any victim, for anyone who's been violated sexually or brutalized or any other way, to come forward and to be respected and to have their voice and to be believed if there's sufficient evidence, that's a good thing. When it gets metastasize into men are all guilty men are all rapists men are masculinity is toxic toxic masculinity what the fuck does that mean toxic i don't think being masculine is toxic at all yeah i have a i have a son who's 15 and when i he, he hears a term like that i have to think that like you have, it, words are categories basically right they your experiences with those words represent the word or the, and vice versa, the reflexive that way. And I better not do a spit take with this mushroom tea. <laughs> and uh, I just hate to think that he hears a word like that and you take, <laughs> it's not the greatest. You're taking two categories, masculinity and toxic behavior, and then smashing them together as yeah, if you're they're, conflating them. Right. And I, 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 I talked to him about it because it's like, I, I want him to understand that because he has masculinity in him or that he's a masculine kid that it doesn't make him toxic or inherently bad and he has to be careful. This is about control. When you control the language and you control the dialogue, you control how people think. People with these radical views, it's not about protecting people, it's about control. They want control. They want to make it a 1984 world where anyone who thinks or speaks differently is a bot criminal. Look at Canada. I have friends in Canada where now it's becoming something along the lines, if you don't use someone's pronouns, it's a crime. It's a punishable crime, which is ludicrous. Look, I live in Hillcrest, which is the gay neighborhood in San Diego. I will use people's pronouns out of respect for them. If someone wants to be called they, them, I don't have any problem with it. I will do it out of respect. But if they want to shout me down or shame me, in order to get me to do that, or God forbid, make it a crime, then that's when I get my hat closed up and I say, hell no, I won't go. Let's talk a little bit about uh, healing. And mm -hmm. we have in our society today something uh, called incels, which I'm sure you've heard of. Yeah. <laughs> I can turn water into wine. I can't turn winers into winners. And that's original with me. What, what do you think the problem really is there? I, that, what I said is funny, but it's true. I can turn water into wine. I can't turn winers into winners. They're winers. Some of them, God bless them, 
I don't believe in God, Bog bless them, are on the spectrum and they can't help it. They're, they're Asperger or mm. uh, autistic or whatever. But many of them just don't have social skills. They have a tremendous amount of, rather than look at where they're lacking in communication skills and emotional self-regulation, they're choosing to be victims and look outward and be angry and resentful at the world that they feel owes them something. They have resentment, which is a spiritual poison and envy. When you resent someone who has what you think you're entitled to, resentment, envy, and entitlement will shut the doors of grace, will shut the doors of the reality that can bring you something that's beautiful and wonderful. And I think there, that's the poison. Confusion, resentment, envy, emotional dysregulation, lack of social skills. So they're just swirling and swimming in poison. And then blaming it on women as yeah. being the problem. And, yeah. yeah. Jim Morrison had a great line. Women are women seem wicked when you're unwanted. People are strange. He summed it up, yeah. yeah. People who look at what you're doing and you say, what people and all this stuff. I say people I'll leave that alone. Go ahead. Would, uh, would say that it seems like what you're doing comes from a place of Are we anger. talking about, no, but also my sales stuff or just the seduction stuff? Because I am much more doing the sales stuff. Okay, I would say seduction stuff. All right, yeah. fair enough. That it seems like you come from a place of ang being angry at women. I was, when I first doing, started doing this, I was filled with rage, pain, resentment, and misogyny. Like an incel? Similar to an incel? I wasn't an incel because I had skills. Well, I was an incel when I started because I didn't know what I was doing. But so you know- but I'm the first like. person to admit that I was not a pleasant person or coming from a place of uh, compassion or- So that's kind of what I was meaning. Like That's totally true. Like uh, I looked early in the on, camera and say that. Yeah, like early on uh, when you were, I mean, I've seen some of the older footage of you teaching and it seemed like you were that kind of person. Like was. there were still remnants of that left. Absolutely. And if you pushed you, I was bit. so profoundly traumatized that every once in a while, when my external circumstances are very difficult, like when I found my brother had leukemia, uh, and when my mother died, that trauma, which is almost like nine percent healed, I'd say it's nine percent. You know the archetype of the wounded healer. Mm -hmm. I consider myself a wounded healer. That wound is never fully closed. It's 95% closed, but I think that's a good <coughs> reminder. It's a reminder to be compassionate. That is the sense that I got from you, that you were, you became a healer because you were wounded. Absolutely. And good uh, catch. Yeah. So, um, in fact, whenever I was talking to Jurgen about you and I wanted to interview you, um, I kind of said, I, to me, he seems this is what's going on. And he's like, yeah, I would say that's pretty accurate. Yeah. And I would say, I know that because that was me too. That was coming from a, a wounded person who needed healing. This is not everybody. Life is inherently traumatic. Yeah. It's chronically traumatic and acutely traumatic. But some people don't seem so wounded or need healing. Um, that everyone does. It's a mask to some, to some extent. But so, I mean, your wound, drove you to actually become very successful, both with women and with money. Not everybody does that. Not everybody feels that pain or that wound and they just kind of slip into. That's, uh, I understand the ability to convert that into creativity, which then changes the world. I have changed the world. I have changed the lives of, I'll say multiple hundreds of thousands of men and saved the lives of thousands. I know this to be true. And so that ability to take that pain and transmute it into creativity, I think that's for a couple of reasons. Number one, I'm hardwired to be creative. It's just, I've created periods when I've been low as hell, when I've been high as hell. I don't mean drugs high, I don't do that. I'm naturally creative, I'm hardwired. People who know me will tell you I'm the most creative person they know and the most generous person they know. I also think a lot of this is from my Eastern European just bloodline. I'm part Ukrainian and part Russian. I was joking with my trainer the other day. I'm a cockroach. I'm a Ukrainian cockroach. Not that Ukrainians are cockroaches. I, uh, uh, I don't want this out of context. Bless them in their struggle against the Russians. But the Eastern European stock, particularly the Eastern European stock, has come from such pain and come from such horrible things. We're just survivors. We just have learned to survive. So you think this is, I guess, somewhat genetic or? I think, I believe that genetic things can be passed on. Yeah, yeah. memories, 
I think trauma can be passed on genetically. There's two books I'll recommend for you that if you don't know them, you ought to read them. One is called Beyond the Brain by Stan Groff. That book was the book that convinced me that we're not just meat suits, that consciousness actually exists outside the brain. And then It Didn't Start With You by Mark Wolin. He talks about generational trauma and how it's passed on. He doesn't speculate how it's passed on, but Groff would say it's passed on through the DNA. I think there's anecdotal evidence and some scientific evidence to suggest that's true. And so you think that's where your pain came from? There's yes. no like major incident you had in your life that sort of... Uh, I think isolation, Yeah. being isolated is extremely traumatic. So you were very isolated as a kid, teenager? You had a big um, family. Teenager. But a lot of them had moved out of the house by the time I was a teenager. So it was essentially me and my younger brother. That isolation is probably create a lot of pain, probably and atrophy, yeah. social skills. Like yeah, that. but uh, yeah, that's true, but also boredom. The worst thing you can do to me is bore me, is put me in a situation where I'm bored. Can seduction transform someone by them using it and addressing that pain? Um, well, before I go on from that, would you say that, that that seduction could be a tool for that? It's not... Well, the way I do it, yes. Okay. And how do you do it that may be different that can be because I address those things through my skills doing hypnosis and NLP. I also teach all my students to meditate. My meditation practice, NLP didn't make me any more compassionate. Maybe it did for you, maybe it did for other people. I don't know. It just made me more powerful. That's not true. I will always had a soft heart for my students, but overall compassionate to the world that came from my Vipassana practice. And that came through meeting the greatest teacher I've ever met, Shinzen Young. Shinzen is to meditation what Milton Erickson was to hypnosis. He made it available to me because it's precise and rigorous. His whole jam is to marry the Western science of objective measurement to the Eastern science of mind. And so that practice, which I still do to this day, if I don't, if I skip that more than a day, I'm going to do well. I've had the direct experience, not as a belief, not as a act of piety, not as a concept, not as a teaching. I have had the direct experience of what Paul calls in, in the Christian Bible, the peace that surpasses human understanding. I've had that directly, only for the briefest moments. If I sit for 30 minutes, I'll maybe get five seconds. Of I've also had the experience of happiness independent of conditions. That's what I'm aiming at. I'm aiming at a life where I can be happy because conditions are going to change or I'm going to age in a way where it, it, it'll suck. So NLP, love it. NLP addresses the small suffering of life. Not that the sufferings aren't horrible. Mm. It doesn't address the big suffering the suffering that's interwoven into the very fabric of existence. This is the Buddhist perspective. I'm not a Buddhist, right? But many of the concepts to me are self-evident and they're very useful in, in, to direct me. When you really solved this problem for yourself where you, know, you weren't connecting with women and then suddenly you're using this technology that you're creating, you're now connecting with Thank women. Thank you for calling it a technology, that's how you Thank yeah. you. Uh, well, that's the way I see it. I mean, thank you. Absolutely. That's a profound compliment. Yeah. Thank you. You break through. Now you're getting as much as you want, as much sex as you want, as much dating as you want. You'd be surprised. I'm not promiscuous and never have been. So that does surprise me, because I was going. I was going to ask you. Um, do you think that you use <clears throat> once you solve the problem? <clears throat> sometimes the, the solution also becomes a problem where you're using it to. I've cope. never been promiscuous. So you like to get on words. Do you know what that word means? I think it means being, uh, I don't know, does it mean having many sexual partners? No. What does it mean? It means indiscriminate. I've never been indiscriminate. You could be an, a promiscuous eater, meaning you don't really care what you eat, you just put it Thank in front you. of you. Thank you, educated me, I appreciate that. Yeah. So the reason where the word came from is whenever one of, it was one of the Kennedy kids, but he didn't have the last name of Kennedy, but he was accused of raping that woman. Oh. They called her sexually promiscuous. Oh. 
indiscriminate. And then that's it just tight. got move. It just got over and over. People hear it to the point where they think that means having lots As of sexual partners. As I've gotten partners. older, I've gotten a lot more discriminate. Yeah. So promiscuous, you could have a lot of sexual partners, but you can be very discriminate about who you are with. So then you wouldn't I'm be just never, uh, When I was younger, it, it appealed to me. But now, <laughs> I'm gonna look in the camera. Uh, but now, sex is. For me, it's got to have uh, an element of emotional connection. And also, I have a policy, which is pole doesn't go in the hole. When the dick goes in, the crazy comes out. <laughs> you can quote me on that. <laughs> well, yeah, wait, 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 let me finish. So for me, it's uh, I don't have intercourse for at least six weeks to two months, and we both get tested. Well, okay. And but anyone who won't get tested has something to hide. It's an absolute deal killer. Okay, so the story. let's jump back though. Let's say when you've the technology was formed, you like that word about it. The speed seduction was mm -hmm. formed, mm -hmm. and you're how old when this happens? Eighty-seven. That was when I first started experimenting with it. Uh, I was born in 1958. I don't know. Do the math. My math is spotty, and I'm also hungry and a little tired. From okay, the so you were in your 30s, let's say. Yeah, but those hormones are still kicking. Oh yeah, hard. yeah. So did you ever feel like you got to a point where you were actually using sex to cope with that pain rather than continue to evolve through it and move through it and heal? I'm sure that was the case. I never thought about it, but I'm absolutely certain that was the case. Do you think if men were having more sex, there would be less violence in the world? My first instinct is say, yeah. Mm -hmm. That's the same feeling that I've gotten. All right. I want to show you some clips of you. Mm, great. Yeah. <laughs> Who was um, that? Yeah. was that young, young man. Hello, everyone. I don't know if you noticed by the shots that we're taking, but this is an audience of all women today. We have invited them here for a reason, because we have three men with different points of view. He says he got tired of being Mr. Nice Guy and being dumped by women. So Look at that. Look at how much hair I had in the, the Geek Boy Owl Man glasses. How to get the women you desire into bed. <laughs> And they're just the moans. I don't care. Fuck them. Right. So uh, I knew I was on to something. My whole thing, Damon, was I knew I would piss off the female audience. And I knew the men were a minority of the people watching at home. But those watching would think they're trying to shout him down. He must have something. That was the deliberate strategy. Plus, it was fun for me. So what I, I've watched this a few times. And you're saying so many things that make so much sense. Of course. 30, 35, 30 years later, it's still true. But, People are yeah. mouthing my words. But you're also saying things that you are are obviously going to piss them off. Of course. Okay, just so we get some answers. I'm in a comic class. I may, uh, I may leave some of those balls hanging Mom up there for you ladies to slam dunk later on. But that's your prerogative. All right? Ross, what do women really want? I don't care what they want. I only care what they respond to. See, my focus is a little bit different from the other guests. There's what women say they want, there's what women Absolutely think they true. want, and then there's what they actually respond to. I'm not an academic, I'm not a theoretician, I'm interested in what works on the street when Absolutely it's time true. to date and mate. And what women actually respond to is not what they say they want. So what do they respond to? Look at her. They really what a respond beauty. to a guy who's a challenge, a guy who's a question like, mark, a guy who... Keeps women know this, what you're saying, of course. The beginning, the less attractive you are physically, the more you have to rely on your attitude. Totally and that's true. what I wrote my book for. I wrote my book for the average looking, even ugly guy See, that goes out there in the real world and tries to be a nice guy. I'm actually quite handsome if you look at me. So no more Mr. Nice Guy. You can I be think you were... You see, no. we, we got to define our terms. By nice, I mean accommodating. When you accommodate, you get what the commode gets. You get the crapola. You have to learn how to say no to a woman. Yeah. Cool. I, I, as I said, I'm gonna let a lot of these things hang, and uh, it's just how can you deny life. that? No, I mean that was so, 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 so and that, that was something I saw when I was in high school, and I was really frustrated. And all these, I was, I just decided I'm gonna ask these the hottest women in, in high school, what are they, what are they like, in a, in a man? And <clears throat> once I compiled it all, and then I actually considered who they were dating and who they dated, like on and on. It wasn't just like one guy. None of them matched what they were saying they wanted. There's a book series I used to love reading, a pulp fiction book series, not to be confused with the novel. Right. The movie. Movie. And it's, it was called The Destroyer. And one of the lines in one of the novels were, what are a man's words? Puffs of air from between 
his lips. If they came out the other end, they'd be farts. <laughs> and it's the same with women, men and women, humans. Yeah, I with mean, all humans, the truth watch is, yeah, what you, they do. The truth right. is in their behavior, not right. their words. Right. I think you could say the same thing to men. You could, I just you, said all yeah. humans. Yeah. So, I know how to manipulate women and get what I want. <laughs> See? This point is so preposterous. Get a shot at this audience. Every woman sitting here is sitting on more power than Con Edison pumps out in 10 years. True that. You control the access to sex, and that is an incredible amount of power. Man yes. asks, the woman says yes or no. She has the power, and that makes... Wait a second. So, there's that, and then... Um, what else you got, boss? It's about one thing. Got it! I honestly believe, I honestly do believe that there's no better way a woman can win, spiritually, physically, emotionally, than being with me. I really believe that. Do you I really answer the question? Do you believe that Does now? it matter to you? Do I believe it now? Yeah. I believe it's meaningless. I don't know that I believed it back then. That was something that... Yeah, the first time I heard that, I was like... Huh, I don't know. Uh, it sounds like it might have been one of those beliefs that you wanted to wanted to believe. Yes. Yeah. That's quite accurate. You wanted to respond quickly. You like me, you, you know, need to clean your screen. Thinking yeah. that I enjoy having to behave this way. Simply women have taught me that this is what true. To I used women to teach nice. men what works. I used to be sweet, I used to be sensitive, I used to listen. I dated my left hand when I did that. And now and now, now you know, okay. and, and I But you're still a nice guy, right? No, I'm a pleasant guy. You're a pleasant guy. Nice as a people pleaser, doesn't know how to say no. Okay. Yeah, okay. Doesn't have a backbone. I'm pleasant. Pleasant is power held in check and exercised with finesse. What do you think when you see your younger self like that on the talk show? I think that was one hilarious fucking genius. <laughs> and so, a genius marketer. Are you just older, more experienced, and wiser, or have you transformed since then? <laughs> oh, yeah, transformed. But my my seduction marketing is still that obnoxious. So you, <laughs> it's funny you. I mean, you know it's obnoxious. That's the point of, of it. That's what you want out of it. Of course. And I could be absolutely wrong about this, but I just feel like maybe if it wasn't that obnoxious, you could have you could reach more people. And you've heard that before. As a, my favorite ex-girlfriend taught me. <laughs> so would you feel like you're not being authentic if you taught it any other what way? What does authentic mean? Oh, it's you. I, no, you no, know. no, no. I'm going to challenge you on these loosey I would say authentic is aligning, aligning with your own values. One of my values is to torment people who are stupid. That's not a value. Yeah. That's a behavior. Ooh. Is it? <laughs> yes. Is Tormenting it? people is a behavior. Humor. Humor is a value. value. No, yeah. Humor is a value. Be the, um, if you get off on other people's pain, that's, that's not pain. That's just well, annoying them. Well, yeah, you were the younger brother. That's where this comes from. Huh? Huh? You used to annoy the hell out of your older siblings, right? Is that where this comes from? Because I used to love it. Man, when I, I'm, a, I'm a middle kid. Teasing my younger brother did like for no, me. No, Teasing no, my older. No, 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 no. I just have always, my mother would call me an agitator. My mother would say, you're an agitator. And I'd say, what's that? My mother influenced a lot of my thinking. She was a brilliant woman, the most brilliant human, the most brilliant woman I've ever met. Yeah, what if someone said that, you know, the way that you're writing this stuff, it's not just that it's obnoxious, it's hurtful. It probably is hurtful to some people. But that sort of is out of a You can't have power. You can't have power with some people, without some people getting hurt. But hurtful in what way? I, I'm serious about this. Mm -hmm. They're not, well, so it hurts their feelings. I wanna, actually, are, 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 okay, I want to challenge their power. power. Yeah. On power. I don't think that's a good thing. I don't think to, to aspire power. Power is not a good thing? No. Well, it's, it's, it's going to happen. It's going to happen. A, a leader will have power, have influence, but I don't think it's a good thing to go after. Because power always implies power over. So you either oh, power... Is it? How, how does it not? You have to have power over something. It, it, with no context, it? power is, is meaningless. No, it just means power to move things. doesn't no, mean you're so you power mean, over. You might mean capability? Capability, yeah, yeah ability. That's the, what's, the, what, what's the difference between, in your mind, power and capability? You mean as defined by physics? F equal M times no, no, what you're after. Force you say you want power. Mass times acceleration. No, 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 no. Come on, you want power. You, you value it. Okay, and I'm saying... I value being... I've been told by many women that, you're, that I'm a very powerful person. Okay. Meaning I have presence and I don't apologize for my beliefs. And I know how to present myself, and I have charisma. And you need power to do that. I think that is power. You're you're thinking of power as coercion or the point of a gun. I don't think of it that way. But nobody can define power as anything 
I mean, you could call it capability, you could call it all these things, but yeah. it's like, well, then it's capability. It's not power. Power means something as an implication of power over something. That's what you think. But how can you have power without it having that implication? You have to have a context. You have power it. flowing in here. You well, that's, different. that's completely different. We're talking is about it? the kind of power that you're talking about. You don't think the power that you aspire to or that you want is the okay, same so as... Okay, so call it capability. If you're split, if it makes you feel good and you're soft... But wait a minute, hard. but wait a minute. This <laughs> is the you, the, the guy who's a really a stickler about words and what do you mean? Yeah. Yeah, so I'm saying when you look at power, the implication in it is is there's a bad power thing. to move. Not necessarily. You can have power to move people, a good orator. Yeah, that's capability. So I consider it to be synonymous. Well, but and, and so words matter, right? And so I think, and, and I'm not just coming at you on this because you're Ross Jeffries. Did Jesus have power? But see, here's the thing. You're there. If you're a Christian, I don't believe so. But if right. you're no, a Christian, no, no. You're, some people are Jesus going to have, have power. power. The, the president's going to have power. Yeah. Like I'm not. I'm not saying that power shouldn't exist. It exists, whether I want it to or not. What I am saying, though, is when power is one of your values, your power can be the power to move. Not capability. Power, huh? It's a capability. Okay. We're just yeah. going to sit here and ping pong. Yeah, I know. But for another but hour. Here's the thing. When you go after power, why do powerful people want more power? You think oh, they have everything that they they have. All the I will define as capability then. Okay. Oh, we'll seed you the argument because I think it's kind of it's kind of like a I'll drug. I'll seed you the argument and right. say it's it's. I'm not beating, it, I'm beating, I'm beating. <laughs> beating me. We're just <laughs> we're just educating each other. Yeah. No. And but Isn't I, it, now, what makes you think that you need to beat me? What wound is that? No, it's from? just a joke. Uh, it's okay, so I'm joking, joking too. Yeah, no. no, no, and this is why I like talking to you because. I like people who who say we got our lightsabers out. Yeah, 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 yeah. And you educate me on words. I'm like, oh shit. Okay, I get it. And then I can turn around and do the same thing because words mean precisely what I want them to mean. That's from Alice in Wonderland. That's power. That's power. <laughs> what are you most satisfied with in your life? Being an incredible teacher. Yeah. Yeah. And what is your? And also my friends. And my loving my friends and being a great friend. My friends will tell you that I am the best friend and the most generous person they've ever met and the most compassionate and the kindest. I will lay down my life for my friends. I only have a few of them. I have to know them five for years. like five years. They become my fibers and I'll do anything for them. There's nothing I won't do for them. Mm. Other than commit a crime. What do you think is your greatest contribution to the world? Teaching men how to be successful women, saving lives. I know that I've saved lives. I've had people come to my seminar and said, I had a bottle of bleach waiting for me. I was going to drink the bleach or I was going to eat a bullet. Saving lives. I have saved. Say what you want about me. You hate my marketing. You don't like me as a person. I got a little dick. Not true. <laughs> you say whatever you want. But at the end of the day, shut up because I've saved thousands of lives and you haven't. When you're gone, what would you like to be remembered for? The greatest teacher that people have ever met and one of the greatest thinkers and a fantastic friend and brother and son and uncle because my nephews are all smarter than I am. I love that. I taught my nephews how to think. If you ever talk to them, my older sister's kids, I taught them all how to think. One of them said he recently had a kid. I said, I'm really proud of the young, of the adult that, that you've grown into and seen you as a father. And he texted me back. He said, uncle, being a father has shown me what a great uncle you were for us. You were always there for us. You were so involved in our lives. You taught us so many things. Being a dad has shown me what a great uncle you've been for us. Oh, what a compliment. Yeah, what a compliment. And he's a genius. He finally, when he turned like 19, was able to beat me in an argument. And he went there. I said, I couldn't be prouder. So a lot of people ask me, because I'm known as the NLP guy on YouTube. And a lot of people ask me, when did I first encounter NLP? When did I first start learning NLP? Or what prompted me to do that? And uh, so it happened, I was about 19 years old. I was lit in my college dorm room. Uh, Which sort of college? In the University of New Orleans. Oh, okay, New Orleans. Yeah, and uh, I've actually never talked about this publicly before because there was another story that I tell, which is also true, it just came after. Uh, the internet was very new. I was in a lot of pain, kind of like you when you said you went to college. There was all these beautiful women everywhere. I felt mm -hmm. like everybody was out there having sex and I wasn't. I was being left out of the party. Mm -hmm. It turned out not to be true. Mm -hmm. But this whole internet thing was so amazing. You could just look up anything. So I looked up, and I'm not kidding, literally, how to get laid. And guess whose website popped up? <laughs> Moi? Yes. I had no idea what NLP was. I read your stuff and hey, I- aren't you happy you have a big NL penis about you? 
I was prepared for that. I brought came the interview ready to pull that one out of my ass. I'm telling the heartfelt story here. Go ahead. <laughs> I know. So I'm pattern interrupting you. So I, I read your website from top to bottom. Not, not a single word was missed. And I said, I, I don't, I'm completely broke. I didn't have a job. I was, and I said, I got to figure out how to get this home study course. And that was back before it was online. You had to buy it. You had to send a check by email. I know. I know. And get it mailed. I remember. And so I went to my brother and I said, you got to check this website out. And would you split the cost of this? I'll figure out a way to pull up my half. And he, he looked at it and he goes, oh, it's NLP. And I said, what's NLP? And he says, that's uh, what Tony Robbins does. And I was like, what? Like, how, I didn't understand the, the intersection. Yeah. Uh, later, of course, I did. But I got the course mm -hmm. and I memorized everything. And I listened to it at least three times. And I was so scared to go out there and actually use this and i bumbled it and i remember there was a point at which i had to commit it was either quit it let it absolutely. go or commit to it absolutely and i committed to it and the first time that i used it where i wasn't like stumbling right the woman's eyes started to shift really fast and i started to see the what we now call sensory acuity and calibration started coming through and it threw me so hard that I couldn't finish. Uh -huh. I was so shocked. It's very common with my students. It's very common. I use. I, I want to hear your story, but I want to. I got to interject this. So in the beginning, people were saying this is a fraud. It doesn't work, and they were saying it works because people believe it's going to work, like Dumbo's magic feather. And I would get on and say, no, 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 no. First time it works for students, they don't believe it. It's shock. Exactly. Yeah, it's I was like so shocked. Whole breaking of the matrix. Yeah. Keep going with your story. And then it started to really work. Now, here was the other thing too, which is why I'm banging you on the head with all these questions about how you know this is perceived. And I kind of still thought this to this day, if it attracts the wrong person, and with this tool, uh, can major damage be done? And I was kind of worried about that with myself. I thought, I'm gonna become a monster. Uh, Did you? Well, here was the thing. And I, I remember half wanting that and half scared of it. No. What happened was, is I built connections with women for the first time in my life. Exactly. Even though I was not a bad looking guy and I had had, had some girlfriends and I wasn't a virgin, I still had problems where of resentment with for women. Exactly. I did not communi communicate with them very well. I didn't think of them as like really getting inside of them and thinking, well, how do they perceive the world? Or how do they perceive me? Uh, it was the strangest thing. It was a transformation and I transformed and I became so much more compassionate. And just that compassion alone I deeply appreciate that. The nice anchor. I know. I deeply appreciate it. Now send the check. <laughs> the more someone compliments, the less likely they'll pay you. <laughs> so um, and the fucking cheeses. So then I realized uh, how powerful NLP was, but I didn't really know what NLP was right. even at that point. I was just using what you had taught, and eventually that led me to what I'm doing now. I'm not going to bore you with the rest of the story, but it didn't, I'd have an, uh, an encounter with a professor who knew NLP and, yeah. and in one session, my depression went away and I, I was realizing all throughout my life, how powerful NLP was anytime I came into contact with it. And it wasn't until I was finally was depressed again and I had to pull myself out of a really bad situation that I turned to it again. And that's what led me here. So I hate to think if I had not encountered your website and your technology, my life would have probably probably been very different and it pro I probably wouldn't have gotten into NLP. Thank you. So, yeah, I can't thank you enough. Thank you. You may kiss my ring. <laughs> I, 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 I see the Green Lantern ring. I, I, this is why I sometimes think of myself as a hero, that I'm super heroic, that I really change people's lives and often save them. And I have to think that if somebody has misused what you've taught, which anybody can do with yeah, anything, sure yeah, that the net good, the net positive you have done is far, far outweighs, far, yeah, far outweighs, far outweighs the, the, the negative. So yeah, I gotta say it's a real honor to be sitting with you here and doing this with you. And Thank I do you. agree, you are an incredible teacher. Thank you. Because I've encountered a lot of bad NLP teachers, and uh, it's night and day. I mean, and how well you learn and how fast you learn when you have a good teacher. Yeah. Nothing, of course, can take the place of practice, which you no. often said over and over again. You've got to practice. You have got to do to this. Practice. And my brother never used the stuff. All he did was study it, read it, memorize it, never used it. And when he saw me using it and getting the results, he was like, well, how are you doing? I was like, there's one simple answer. You just practice. You have to practice. Yeah. So I want to thank you so much. Oh, for, you're welcome. You're buying dinner? I'm buying dinner. <laughs> I enjoyed this immensely. I'm glad. Thank, thank you.
If you're interested in knowing more and connecting with Ross, you will find some links in the description below this video. If you enjoyed this interview, let me know by clicking like, and if you have any suggestions for future interviews that you would like me to do with interesting people, let me know in the comments below.